sir. Thank you. You're very welcome. Let there be magic. So good morning. Um, I'm really sorry that they put me first uh, for you guys because we're going to talk a lot about uh, Ruby internals, and that's a um, what that basically means is a lot of C code. So we're going to see maybe 20 lines of Ruby, give or take, and then hundreds of lines of C code. And I don't know if you expected that. You're welcome to step outside for some extra coffee and whatnot while this goes on. But um, so that's what we're going to embark on this morning. Um, just a couple formalities, I think. If the clicker works. Ah. Um, if you're looking for me on the internet, um, I go by Amateur Human. Um, that's Twitter, Gmail, all the normal things. I think there's one service that someone else stole Amateur Human from me somehow, um, and I'm really pissed. I'm trying to get it back. Um, I am a GitHubber. Um, been there only a few months, but um, it's as weird as people make it out to be. Um, but that's my day job. My night job is karaoke. So um, we definitely think we've discovered a karaoke location in um, in Lyon that we're going to try to do tomorrow night. Um, so. I don't remember the name of it. It's like K-Bar. Is that a thing? Um, so uh, karaoke is definitely a thing we should do. Um, as you can see, Terrence is a big fan of karaoke. Um, also, I am a member of the Blue Hat Club. Um, so if you are willing and interested in, in applying to be part of the Blue Hat Club, please um, see our godfather, uh, Terrence. He speaks at the end of the day tomorrow. Um, so back to actual reality. So strings. Why, why look at strings? when we were looking at Ruby internals. Like, what is it about strings that makes it interesting? Um, and there's a couple of experiments that are worth exploring to see kind of why we would look at Ruby internals through the string class in general. So first, strings, just booting up RIB, or RIB, strings are the most allocated thing there by a magnitude of four. So we're just, first off, we're, we're generating tons and tons of them. It happens constantly. Um, it's almost 60% of all allocated objects when we first do it. Now, when you get Rails involved, Rails gets like a little nutty and adds 113,000 new strings to all allocated objects. So strings have a, a lot of importance. Basically, everything becomes a string. Um, your Every load path that you um, add, that th it gets becomes a string. All your source code becomes a string, all put into memory. All of this memory has to get looked over and examined over and over as we try to free up new memory. So what is it about strings that we can improve, and where can we find optimizations in order to like, get a better performing Ruby? So there's a couple idiosyncrasies about strings that kind of give us some clues. The first one was discovered, I think, or at least made popular by um, Pat Shaughnessy um, about a year, year and a half ago, I think. Um, and this is a, a, the code. This is some of the only Ruby we'll, we'll see. Um, so what we're doing here is we're starting with a series of strings. So starting with 20 character strings going up to 25 character strings. We're just going to iterate over them and just return them um, about a million times each. And we're going to see how long it takes to do a million um, returns of these basic strings. And we're adding, just as a note, we're adding a, an x to the end of the string uh, because Ruby tries to be performant. And if you're returning exactly the same string, it's going to do a shared string. So we have to change it every single time. So we're going to do that, and then we're just going to use benchmark to get some results. This is what we get. So you see that um, 21 through 23 characters, we're averaging about 200 milliseconds. But the second we get to 24 characters and above, then we go to another, 300, uh, another 160 uh, milliseconds in general. So why is that? So we can explore. What we'll do is we'll explore the, the string um, implementation, and we'll look through all of the code that generates this, and we'll find out why. The next thing we want to look at before we dive into that is another idiosyncrasy. This is about how much space strings take. So I needed a couple helper methods here. So what I've got is um, something that's returning all the unique uh, object IDs of all the objects I'm creating, and then something that's actually going, to back, going back and looking up all of the memory space that all those objects are taking. So again, we're just going to do this about a million times. First, we're going to take a string of 23 characters and, and return it a million times. And then we're going to do another one that's frozen a million times. And then we're going to take a look at all of the, all of the objects that um, are strings. We're going to split them into two groups, uh, frozen ones and non-frozen ones. And then we're going to go back and do some math on them with those helper methods I just created. So this is what we get. In Ruby 1.9, we get kind of what you'd expect. right? We, we create two million strings, a million of each. Obviously, there's some extra junk in there, just like we saw when um, IRB boots up. 
Um, but basically what we're kind of expecting. But in Ruby 2.1, we get something very different. The space that strings are taking when they're frozen is much, much smaller. Because there's an optimization that's being put in um, that if a string is frozen, it becomes immutable. And so then it uses the same object of ID of, this, of a different string of the original string that was first made with that same character set. So all we had to do is do, we created it once with one object ID, and then that next 999,999 all share the same object ID. And whenever we need to change one of those, whichever one of those other millions we do, it just copies it to another location and gives it a new object ID. So until then, we have all of this shared memory. And we're saving massive amounts of space. So let's look at what a string ends up looking like in C. Um, I'll let you look at it. That's all you need to know. This is string all of in its glory. Um, let's pick it apart a little bit. First, in string, every Ruby object has this thing called rbasic. This gives every Ruby object the same sort of foundation in which um, the, the C implementation um, can work. So in that, we have two major components. First, we have a flags table, the ability to access all the variables that um, kind of modify and um, kind of guide all the metadata about our objects. And the second one is a class. All it is is a pointer to um, the class itself. So in this case, it's our string. It's not really that interesting. The next, the main body of this um, class, of the implementation, you get to this thing called a union. I don't know how many people grew up on C. I did some of it, but um, unions was something I used a lot. But what a union does is it allows you to do two different kinds of data structures in the same memory space. So what happens when this object gets created, it's either, um, it's either going to be the top struck or it's going to be the, the bottom array. But it's not going to ever be both. It can only be one of those. Um, and it's going to be saved as as. You can see back, the, just before the last semicolon, the variable name of this is as. You'll get a sense why that comes, why that actually makes sense, and you'll get to see why C kind of C of Ruby looks a lot like Ruby. Um, it's really interesting to kind of discover. So, so let's look at the struct, the first part of this. The struct has a couple different components. First, the main parts that we really need, right? The things that you would really expect in a bare implementation of a string: the length and the character, and a pointer to the character set itself. Pretty basic. The struct also includes. Um, Another union. So this union is now working on um, what we call capacity and shared. So what happens is when we allocate memory for a string, the interpreter th knows that we're going to change that string probably often. And we can either go realloc um, new memory. We can do another malloc to get more memory. But those are really heavy operations. So what it does is it, over, it oversubscribes memory for this string in the very beginning. And then this pointer is what's holding how much extra memory we have until we have to actually go do uh, another allocation of memory. And then there's the pointer to it. So let's look at it in a different way. It makes it a little bit easier to see. So a basic string, we have our, ba our basic and sort of indented to help you identify like where the different unions kind of come together. If we had a string that was long, one that was 43 characters, something like the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, it's going to be stored in the normal method, right? It's going to be stored in with a character pointer pointing a different set of memory, and as well as the long with actual the, the character count, so it doesn't have to do a string length um, after, it go gets, after it goes and gets that memory itself. If we did something small, like hello, it's going to be stored in the array. But why is that? You're asking, you're probably wondering, like, where does the 23 characters come from? What is it, the difference about these things? And just as a note, all, all C strings in, in Ruby are null character ended, so you always have an extra character on the end of all of your strings. So where does 23 come from? So this is where it becomes really interesting. So we've got, we're back to our implementation. So the union only allocates as much memory as its largest member could be. So that's either one, the, um, the struct, the heap, or it's this array. So if it's this, if it's the heap part, then it's got three components. It's got the long, the character, and that second union. Each of those are eight bytes on a 64-bit computer. So that means it's 24 characters. Then we, so that's at very, very least, it's 24 characters. Then we could, theoretically, have this character. It could, it could actually assign, let's call it 30 characters. It could hard code 30 in there. 
Um, but instead, it's actually got this macro running R string embed length max plus one. And this actually lets us verify um, kind of why 23 actually is working. So if you're not familiar with macros, macros are just code substitution. So it's just calling out, and it's going to execute this. So what we're doing here is we're taking the size of value, size of a pointer, eight bits, multiplying by three, dividing by one, because the size of a character is one. So that's, we're still at 23, or excuse me, we're at 24. We minus one, and now we're down at 23. So the return value for embed, for our string embed len max is 23. So we can see that either case, no matter which direction this, this method chooses, whichever union, half of its union actually gets allocated, it's always going to be 23 characters, or 24 characters, because we add the plus one back here for the null character. But getting at this data gets really complicated. How do you determine where to find the data? If you wanted to get to the length of this, char of this string, where do you, what do you have to do to get to it? You could go through the union, or you could go through the character set. We do more macros, and basically CRuby is macros all the way down. And that's the most, I think, disturbing part um, of CRuby is not, when I first looked at it and I first opened it up, I said like, nope, I'm out. I had no idea what was going on. And how many of you have opened up a source file and then just immediately closed it? Just like, I have no idea what's happening here. And I don't think it's that difficult. And that's actually one of the reasons why I've given this talk, and one of the reasons I gave a previous talk called um, Down the RV New Obj Rabbit Hole, which goes through all, ro all allocation um, all the way down to the garbage collector again. Um, and I think it's really important that we get more involved in Ruby and Ruby implementation. So don't be afraid of macros. They're only code substitution. I, I consider them convenience methods. And this is actually where I think the Ruby core team gets really, really kind of clever. So if I want to get the length back of this string, all I need to do is call our string length and pass in the string that I actually want. That's going to do a bunch of magic for me. It's going to check to see if the string is embedded. Um, and it's going to do that through looking in the flags or seeing if we've if we compiled Ruby to not allow embedded strings whatsoever, because you can do that for some reason. I'm assuming it's for embedded systems, something or other. So. If it, if it does allow embeds, if it is embedded, then it's going to call another macro, our string embed length. What that's going to do is, is do another set of code substitutions. We're not going to go all the way down through macros because we'll just spend all day going through macros. But what this is doing is a bit mask. So inside of the header of the object itself, there's a bit mask that actually stores the length when, when Ruby is embedded the um, characters themselves. So we're popping it out that direction. Or we can retrieve it normally. Now, if we didn't have these macros, you'd have to write this code over and over and over. And so these macros are really handy. Um, and basically, this is how we can kind of control the Ruby memory system um, without having to care about the implementation details of if they ever do move where length is stored in that heap, if it ever moves out of that heap, as long as I'm always calling our string length, doesn't matter. I'm always going to get back the right length. So where do we put all this stuff? We, we figured out that we can store stuff. It's got to go somewhere, though. So let's look at what the anatomy of the memory system itself looks like. Your computer has a bunch of memory on it. Your operating system takes up a bunch of it. Then the Ruby virtual machine takes up a bunch of it. It actually partitions a bunch off to these things called heaps. There's two different kinds of heaps in Ruby. There's heap slots. Bear with me on this, by the way. There's heap slots. Um, and this is where we store all of our Ruby objects. And then there's the process heap. So when our strings get over 23 characters, we have to store that, that somewhere. And so we push that um, into the process heap itself. So each of these slots, sometimes called a page, is 480 slots long. These slots all are 40 bytes apiece. That's the size of any Ruby object. The largest Ruby object that can get created is 40 bytes. And then after that, it needs to go into the process heap. So each page is allocated 16 thousand, 16K in memory. Um, and that, that's how we end up with 408 of these little guys um, in every page. So at boot, the default number of slots that get allocated is 10,000. It's a pretty small number. It only gets you, um, hard math, 25 pages of, of data. Um, GitHub, when you boot up GitHub, uh, that actually boots up about 600,000 um, individual slots, so we actually have a much higher, we, you can override um, the minimum required, the default 
um, we have a much higher initial allocation. So we, we create these early on so that we don't have to do it later. So what happens is each of these pages is stored in a, in a list called Eden. And these are, Eden is where Ruby is allowed to allocate memory to. It's like, here's, here's pre-allocated memory. We've got it all sorted out. Um, just pick one of these things off this list, and you can put an object there, like our string. So we can put strings and arrays and all the things that you want to put in there. But Ruby also wants to be a little bit more conservative in this, because you don't want this fragmentation in your memory, which you're going to be bouncing around. What you really want to do is have memory that looks a little closer to this. So there's two lists. There's Eden, and there's the tomb. And these pages are already allocated. They already have memory assigned to them, but we don't want to keep putting memory back into them. We don't want to keep putting new objects into them until one page is already full. So what we do is we, we hold off these other heaps, these other heap slots or pages, until um, one page is, is entirely full, then we add another one, and then we release them back during garbage collection. So in the end, this is what our memory will look like. And once we get all of our pages full with all of our Ruby objects, that triggers a garbage collection. That says, we don't have any way to create new Ruby objects. We need to go and find some old ones and get rid of them. So let's take a gander at what um, garbage collection looks like. Uh, this is the last Ruby you'll see. Um, I actually don't think there's that much C left either, so you're probably in the clear. All we're doing is creating some garbage here. There's actually a typo on that second line, uh, the third line solo. I should be, I should be injecting the, the new foo. But what we're doing is creating a fake class creating an empty array and putting one of, I want to put a foo in that array, and then I want to do it again with um, whatever number, 10,000 of them. And your memory is going to end up looking something like this. So what happens is each of these root objects gets kept in a list. Ruby likes to keep lots of lists. And then what happens is um, there's a chain down from there. And so what we need to do is as, we're, as our memory is running, as our processes are running, um, you know, Objects get lost, they get deallocated, you nil something out, it's no longer attached to anything else. And eventually, we get all of our slots are full up because we have all these broken links between our memory and what's actually in use. And so this is where the first phase of garbage collection comes in. It's called the marking phase. So marking starts at the root and marks everything that it can touch from the root down. It goes through every single thing. So in this case, we start at foo and we hit the, the class um, and we start with solo and we hit the, the class itself, uh, and then as well as the object we got created for it. Um, but anything in the mini is, is broken. We nilled that out at some point in time, let's say. So what happens is now I've got all of these marks, and now I need to go through a sweep phase. The sweep phase is the second half of the garbage collection process. Sweep phase basically says, walks through the chain, finds anything that was marked. Anything that was marked is going to get promoted. And I'll talk about what promoted means in a minute. And anything that wasn't marked is going to get thrown back into the free list, and, being and that's where the page opens back up. So now we have all of these objects that are promoted, and they're all good to go. We keep, all tr we keep track of all of this stuff in the flags. At the top of the page, there's a unique data set um, that keeps track of all these things. It's a bunch of bit math um, in order to keep track of the different uh, variables that have to deal with things. So everything from, is a string frozen? You find out from there. Is a string um, promoted? Just find that. If it's a right block protected, which is something to do with a new garbage collector, um, it's done there. So let's look at what mark and sweep looks like in a real functional way. So we've got a Ruby process. This is time passing. Um, as we go on, we, um, things happen. In Ruby, if you want to know the history of Ruby's garbage collection, I'm not going into the history of it, but you can look at a different talk earlier. Um, Ruby is a stop the world garbage collector. It means nothing can happen, no, mu no mutations can go on while the garbage collector is happening. In 1.8, these things used to be very long processes. Imagine all the, red, all the red, pink colors mashed up together. So we had these very long pauses in the process. So, now we, do, we have a stop the world, but what we're trying to do is getting to a limited stop the world. So the marking phase still stops the world for a much longer time, because it has to traverse the entire object system. Uh, but the sweep phase is much, much, lim is much um, more interspersed. It's a, what's called a lazy sweep. It's only going to sweep as much memory, it's only going to clear as much memory as it needs to allocate the next set. So if it needs... 15 slots in order to do the next part of the process, it's only going to stop the world for enough time to collect 15 slots. 
So as you saw in the first slide in the garbage collection, uh, Ruby is a stop the world generational garbage collector. So what does it mean to be a generational garbage collector? And this is all Ruby 2.1, if that wasn't clear, sorry. So generational garbage collector is, has to do with um, objects that have already existed once, and the garbage collector has passed by them. Those are the ones that got promoted the last time around. And then new objects got created again. So this is that middle column. Those are new objects that got created in the process. So when we want to go through a sweep phase, if we think if the object has been around once, it might, it's likely that it's going to stick around for a long time. And this is where Ruby got a bad rap. So Ruby, back in 1.8 days, was mostly intended for short scripts. It, Ruby generally was written as a, as a replacement for Perl for Mats. It was not intended to be a long-lived um, process that runs. And so its garbage collector way back in the day was very naive. It was just a simple mark and sweep. But then Rails came along and changed what Ruby was, had been originally designed for. And we had these very long-lived processes. Well, all of your Rails code gets loaded into memory. And most of Rails code never changes. You might metaprogram some things here or there. But for the most part, you're going to keep looking over that, um, that controller over and over. You're going to see if that's still valid. That gets pretty t time intensive. And so what we're trying to do is get out of that process. And so um, Koichi, with the most recent versions of the garbage collector, that's what he's been solving for, is these long-lived processes that don't need to keep checking to see if these objects still exist in memory, because they don't need to change. So we get these promoted objects. These objects have already been seen by the garbage collector once. It's not going to bother to check through them first. What's going to happen in our... Um, in our timeline is that instead it's going to start with the things that haven't been touched yet. In the very first time, these are all new objects. It's going to first check to see if those are still in use. If they are, those get promoted. And eventually, we get to a world in which all our page is filled up with all entirely promoted objects. And then we do another, we do another garbage collection at that point in time, which goes through all objects. But what we want to keep doing is we want to keep bouncing around between only these small living objects. Um, most objects, at least in the uh, GitHub code base, 95% of the objects themselves become long-lived. So we're only, we, we would be scanning across 95% of the objects in the memory space every single time if we didn't have a generational garbage collector. That's a lot of time wasted. That's a lot of pauses. When we implemented 2.1 and um, some of the custom patches, we went from a 58-second sweep time to a 7, or 58-millisecond sweep time to a 7-millisecond sweep time. We cut massive amounts of time, the massive amounts of pauses that our users couldn't be doing something. Um, we cut that down, and that was the goal. So I don't know if this has been terribly interesting to you. There's a bunch of resources that I think are interesting. I find this stuff really interesting, and I think it's more important that we get more involved in, in communicating with Ruby and the Ruby core team. Um, I don't think the C code is all that intensive. Um, once you get into it, once you spend a couple hours kind of playing with it and looking around, you will find that it's actually quite surprising how Ruby-like it is. And it makes sense. You know, Matt calls himself a C programmer. He doesn't use Ruby every day. But if he's the one that designed Ruby, then chances are he's writing C very much like it. So I encourage you to like, dive in a little bit, um, see what it's like, and then go from there. So the great, great places to start is um, the Hacker's Guide. This is a Japanese, um, Japanese translated. Some of it's been translated by humans. Some of it's been translated by a machine. It's decent, but it has probably the most um, extensive commentary on all of the uh, C code that exists. Um, Pat Shaughnessy's Ruby Under a Microscope, I'd recommend reading that. Um, that's a good introduction to C inside of Ruby. It's a lot lightweight. Um, if you're really interested in garbage collection in this object space in general, then Koichi's talk from RubyConf 2013 is the, the quintessential one to go to. Um, I would recommend reading through the slides, watching the video, and then reading through the slides again. Um, the slides are kind of like jumbly if you haven't done this space. And then um, Aman Gupta, who works for GitHub, has been doing um, a lot of work in performance for GitHub. Um, and some of this work came from him. So um, I wanted to call out his work. And I think you should check out that. And that's it for me.